Michael Afton are with me. You can't take your eyes off Test cricket this summer. No, that's where the fireworks have come this summer, even though there's been a fair bit of, of white ball cricket as well. But it's really Test cricket where, where the most interesting uh, cricket has, has been seen. The four Test matches at the start, which ebbed and flowed and, and were fantastic to watch. And then this morning, South Africa were outstanding with the ball in pretty helpful conditions. It's, uh, it's a really wonderfully varied South African attack, actually. You've got Nokia, who is fast by any stretch, by any standards. Rabada, who has one of the great strike rates in Test cricket of all time, Marco Janssen, the, you know, fairly new to Test cricket, but at six foot eight and left arm variety, uh, and Ngidi, who's got those kind of variations, which may yet come into play later on in, in the game. So it's it's a good attack. We're not even talked about the spinners Maharaj and Harmer, who's not playing, but they may come into things later on in this series at Old Trafford and the Oval. So a good varied attack. So when you are facing a good varied attack, how does that challenge you as a batsman? Is it because you just can't line up one side and you're constantly having to adjust starting, <laughs> game plan, whatever? Well, I think more than anything, it's just the relentlessness. The, you, there's no easy out for you. There's not a, a release valve, so to speak. And they're all asking different questions of you. And I, I think you're right. I, I mean, Jansen in particular looked really awkward. Height, but also a lot of swing. So you've got to protect your stumps, but you're also very conscious of not nicking off. And then we all know about Rabada and Nokia, who, who got off to a bit of a slow start. Not a slow start. He got off to a quick start, <laughs> but he didn't, he didn't get it quite right. Uh, he looked more and more comfortable as the, uh, the, the session went on. So, look... At the start of play, it looked like very difficult batting conditions. So it's not a surprise that England find themselves where they are right at the moment. The question is, can they extricate themselves from that, this and get a, a meaningful score on the board? Bearing in mind, Stuart Broad's already at the crease. You know, he, he's generally there for a good time, not a long time. So uh, England have got a lot of work to do here. I think on three occasions earlier in the season, there were five down for less than 100. So... This is very early days in a, in a, in a game that is a five-day game and a three-match series. So you, can't draw, you can't draw too many firm conclusions. Yeah, England have, have done well in the games earlier in the summer to, to kind of stay competitive when it was tough and, and then you know, find, find a winning position in, in the second half of the game. Uh, and what you'd say is that South Africa's batting, you know, on paper looks as though it's got holes in it as well. And obviously... England have got bowlers that can exploit these kind of conditions as well. So England's aim really now, and you find yourself in this position, quite a long tail, the Nighthawk in at eight, <laughs> and good luck, you know, Nighthawking against Rabada and, and Nokia. But their aim is really to just get a kind of score that keeps you competitive on first innings, somewhere around about that 220 mark, and then just hope to stay in the game on first innings and, and use the second innings then to try and get ahead. Tell with Marco Janssen, who is such a tall man, Sean Pollock was showing us at lunchtime, that he is actually hitting the stumps quite consistently yeah. in terms of how full he is bowling. How big and great a challenge is that as an opening batsman? It's a question to both of you. When you've got this gigantic man coming in, a la Bruce Reed or someone yeah. like that, and you, you know you've got to get forward, but his height is almost demanding that you play a little bit deeper. Well, Reed was the one I was thinking of because there aren't too many. A, the left arm is, is the variety in itself. Um, and then the combination of that plus six for eight, there aren't too many uh, around who've provided that kind of challenge. So Bruce Reed was one that I could think back to a, fa a fair distance back in time, fine bowler for Australia, but very similar height and a, and, a, and a similar challenge, therefore. He could swing it, and when the ball did swing, he had the ability to push it up on a length and hit the stumps. But then when it didn't swing, he was constantly hitting the, the splice of the bat, and particularly in Australia with that steep bounce, was even more of a challenge. So not straightforward. And, and here at Lords as well, you've got that extra factor of the slope from the pavilion end, which should help him bring it back to the right-hander. So given the conditions we've had today, given the variety of the attack that we've just discussed, is it 116 for six pitch? Well, I mean, that's a good question. England would like to... I think if England were four down, they'd probably be reasonably happy. Uh, Alex Lee's there. I mean, that was the one loose shot. Most of the other batsmen have been got out today. That was Alex Lee's trying to play bad ball, wasn't it? Outside, wasn't there to hit. Too early in the innings. Odds against him, and that's a loose shot. Uh, Zach Crawley, I mean, we've seen this a lot from Zach Crawley over the last six months or so. It, ultimately, it's a good delivery in the right area, and we've seen him just poking outside off stump. Uh, you know, that's, that's a, just a good delivery, and he exposed the frailties in his technique. This was the one that actually, to the naked eye, didn't look out, did it? It looked like it might be drifting down leg side. 
Joe Root was definitely go, far from convinced it was hitting the stumps, and when you look at it, it was by the barest of margins clipping, clipping the stumps. So a huge wicket for, for uh, South Africa. And what a delivery that was from Neil Kier to get rid of Johnny Bairstow, the four man looking, seeing the ball like a, a beach ball, but this was just too quick for him. A little bit of angle in, a bit of movement. And he certainly got gas though, wasn't he, Neil yeah. Kier? That's for sure. And then this was the last ball, the very last ball before lunch, which was a further that, that in. That's a good ball. Round the wicket, Andrew would say more as a left hander, but I, I think round the wicket, it's starting to angle in. Then he's run it down the slope. The, the only thing you can say is as a left hander that you can try and just hold your shape and your front side a bit more. Uh, and you might get away with it, but it's a pretty good ball. Uh, and then this is just pace, I think. He's beaten for pace as much as anything, a, a little drag on to the top of the stumps. The, I, I agree with Andrew. The, the one really loose shot was Alex Lee's at the top of the order. You felt like that was a, a shot that is out of character to the player. Now, we touched ahead of the game on the fact that Alex Lee's has doubled his strike rate at the start of this summer compared to the West Indies, where he looked almost frightened to play a shot. Um, so we can't kind of, mm, yeah. you know, be too critical because we know what England are trying to do. But that was a long way from being a ball to drive, I think. It wasn't even a kind of length where you could say you're looking to drive on the up because it was almost a shot that you could have gone back to and cut, such was the length of the ball. So that was the really one very loose shot. Bairstow's, you could argue, was a little loose, but given the way Bairstow's played uh, earlier in the summer, he's always going to come out and try and counter-attack. And some of the others were just got out there. Crawley, uh, Root, Stokes, Folks. You'd say that's good bowling and they've been got out. Rolly Pope is 61, not out. He's standing head and shoulders above his peers at the moment in this game with the bat. What's impressed you with the way he's gone about this innings? Well, I think in a lot of ways this has been the best test innings I've seen him play. Just firstly for the urgency. So he's been looking to be positive. Talk about that, that new positive intent. But it hasn't all been about hitting boundaries. It's about manoeuvring the ball, uh, getting off strike, looking busy and not looking frenetic. And sometimes with him, you feel he's a bit overly fr pumped up and frenetic. Uh, he's hit all the bad balls um, and he has looked a class apart. And that says a lot because, you know, when you look at his first class record, it suggests he's a high, high quality player, averaging over 50. We haven't seen it enough in test cricket. And this just might be one of the breakthrough innings for him. The confused batsman that you saw in Australia... What are the big differences you're seeing now from the Ollie Pope, say, in Hobart to the Ollie Pope that we've seen today at Lords? Well, in Hobart, you saw a young player who was quite frazzled coming to the end of a difficult Ashes series on the back of a difficult 12 or 18 months where he tinkered around a bit with his technique and he'd moved around on the crease a little bit and rather lost his off stump. So if you remember that game at Hobart, mm. he fiddled at a wide one and then got ball behind his legs, leg stump uh, in the second innings. But, you know, many young players go through this process. The, the, the path to achievement is not a straightforward path. You, you, you go through a few peaks and troughs. And young players stepping up a level from county cricket to test cricket, you know, you are challenged in all different ways. Think of some of the pitches that, that you had to play on in India. Um, then that top class pace attack that Australia threw at England on some pitches that, in fairness, did as much as I've ever seen in Australia, actually. So it was a difficult uh, 12 months. Uh, and he was somebody who was battling a bit, trying to find his way. And as young players often do, you tinker around with your methods, searching almost that the grass is a bit greener on the other side. And can I just change and find something? And then the more you change, actually, you lose what's instinctive and natural to you. So I actually rang him up at the start of the season just to have a, a chat, not, not giving me, giving him advice or anything, just to pick his brains on how he was going about uh, trying to work things out. And he basically said, look, I, I got to the start of the season and I, I, I kind of reflected on the 12 months that had gone and just thought, right, enough. I'm just going to stick to a, a reasonably sensible method here. So he went slightly more towards middle, away from off. Um, and he said, I've stopped tinkering. He, his bat, the only other change that I saw was that his bat was just a little bit more uh, slightly over off stump in the back lift. Mm -hmm. So he could access the ball as opposed to tucked in behind himself. Uh, and then he's just 
gone out and concentrated on getting runs, watching the ball, trying to play the situation. And of course, he got 100 in his first innings at number three, which was a, a big innings for him because at the start of the summer in Test cricket, he'd never batted at number three in first class cricket before, never mind Test cricket. Yeah. So he had a lot of questions to answer. I think that 100 just settled him a little bit uh, and he'd had a reasonably successful four Test matches then. Um, he's obviously played a bit of white ball cricket, a bit of 100 cricket in the run-up to this game. So it was always a case of how quickly could he rediscover his rhythm for the, for the longer form of the game. But I think, and I've always said it, I think he's a top-class young player. Of all the young players around the country, I think he's as good as we've got. And, and therefore, to give him a, a chance and a run in the team, I was always pretty confident that he would come through it. Well, his Test match numbers this summer have been good. And I wonder how much confidence and clarity he got from Ben Stokes taking over the test captaincy and just saying one of the first things I said was in my test side I want Ollie Pope and I want him to bat three yeah. there you go there's your backing you know what you're doing and where you're batting go do it yeah and never underestimate the importance of feeling supported feeling valued in the team feeling like you're not playing for your place every time you walk out to bat. And I think Zach Crawley is another one who's felt that very intently over the last uh, 12 months or so. When you look at it, the, the style of cricket England are trying to play at the moment, you need a number three who can play shots. You know, if, if the situation dictates, you need someone who can grab the game by the scruff of the neck and put pressure on the opposition. And Ollie Pope does that naturally. For a lot of the last 12 months, he's been trying to balance his natural attacking instincts with <coughs> staying in. Mm. Um, and so giving that freedom, the, the, the type of attacking cricket that England want to play, giving him the freedom to play that way has seems to have liberated him. Um, he's still going to get out occasionally. He still f flirts outside a, a bit too much, off stump a bit too much for my liking. But um, what I saw today was controlled aggression. And I think that's what really resonates well with me is a, a number three who can kind of assess the situation and say in these conditions this is how I can put pressure back on the opposition rather than just I'm going to be aggressive and attacking and I'm just going to throw the bat at everything that comes my way that's not going to work in these type of conditions. Well it's been South Africa's day so far 116 for six England are the rains are falling here at Lords and we have a delay there's a lot of good things to look at in English cricket a lot of things that are going right and perhaps some things that need adjusting and it can be slightly controversial as to what needs adjusting and what doesn't you are the adjuster you are going to try and you're running this high performance review for those that don't know explain what are you trying to do and with whom well if you just think back to post the ashes that there were all these opinions out there about everything that was wrong with english cricket. there's that sort of post-mortem that was going on and we need to change x y and z and i suppose at that stage i was commissioned to run a review into High performance cricket, really, which is, yes, it's the England team, but it's also the, the professional game that sits underneath it. And um, I suppose our approach has been not to look at it from an opinion based uh, uh, perspective, but rather kind of go, well, where are, what, what's our ambition? As a cricketing nation, what's our ambition? You know, do we feel like England can be the best team in the world across all formats? Uh, I believe we can. Then we've got to say, well, if that's our ambition, where are we relative to that? And where can we learn about high performance systems that work really well? So that's where we've engaged with some people from outside of cricket to ask like, what works well in other sports. We've done a lot of data and analysis as to where England actually are. And let's be honest, like in the last 40 years, England have been number one in test cricket for 12 months. By and large, we've been about the fifth best test team in the world. And we also know that pre-2015, our white ball cricket wasn't great. So, you know, I think traditionally we've been a middling test team at best. I think the other thing about this review is we've also got to be cognizant and, and recognise that the cricket world is changing unbelievably quickly around us. All the, the rise of the d franchises around the world, talk of players getting on year-long contracts with franchises, etc. So this is about future-proofing the game in this country as well. And so what we're trying to do is put a, a, together a group of recommendations to the game around how do we come together to allow England to be successful, but also to make sure there's a vibrant professional game sitting beneath that uh, that prepares players as well as they can for the England team? Um, and ultimately, this is not, you know, people think it's a domestic structure review. It's actually about how do we get in a system that's aligned, that, that people are connected to, that everyone knows their place within that system, and that we feel like we're moving together 
uh, in a direction that, that's going to take England to a better place. So th that's what we're looking at at the moment. There are a lot of levers we can pull. We've got to look at things like player incentives, the pitches we play on, the balls we use, um, you know, maybe even the point structure in domestic cricket. And, of course, we are looking at the domestic game generally and saying, well, how can we make sense of this really difficult and convoluted schedule that we have? There is no perfect solution to any of this, but I, I do feel the more I look at it that the evidence is pointing us in a, in a number of different directions. Uh, and there's a lot of things that we can do that are not controversial and actually make a lot of sense from a lot of perspectives. So uh, it's, a, it's been a really interesting process for me so far and for the rest of the group that have been working on this. We're at the stage at the moment where we are putting together some recommendations that we're going to take to the game and consult on and then... Hopefully, we're going to be in a position sort of mid-September to come out with some firm recommendations. Come back to that bit. But in terms of the voices that you have been listening to and chatting with away from specifically cricket, but nonetheless have reached high-level performance in other sports, what has been the biggest thing that you've taken away from a different perspective, would you say? Well, so, we, you know, we've looked at all the Olympic sports. We've had David Brailsford, who's obviously got a you know, phenomenal performance success record in, in cycling. Um, uh, Simon Simpson, who's now with Man City, who was uh, with the LTA as well. The number one thing, quite frankly, is leadership. You know, and I think we've seen that with Brendan McCullum and Ben Stokes, like real clear leadership saying, like, this is what we need to do as a game and people connecting behind that. Um, and then secondly, it's about execution. You can have the best plan in the world, but you've got to just do, you've got to do it. You know, and, I, and so I think those are the two main things. Uh, the, the sports that have done this stuff really well, they've managed to allocate their resources to the bit. You know, we, we've all got finite, finite resources, There's only so much money we can have. Uh, we, we put that money to the things that actually make a difference and we don't put it to things that don't. And, and I think that's, that's a fundamental challenge we've got in the game is to work out, well, what is actually driving performance? You know, how important is the, the number of games that that players play in county cricket, the opportunities they have with the Lions, for instance, you know, the, 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 the time they have, the coaches that they have and the expertise they tap into when they're playing with the England team. Like, what is the thing that makes the most difference? And, of course, it's a combination of all sorts of things, isn't it? Um, and so we're trying to make sense of all of that. But the overall message is this is about alignment. You know, it's not about England telling the counties what to do. It's not about... Um, the county's doing one thing and England doing another. It's about the game at, at high performance level. I'm not talking about chairs and CEOs and all that. So at high performance level, coming together and getting clarity in terms of what are we trying to develop and how do we best do that together? What's the most contentious issue, do you think, that you, you'd be putting to a vote or whatever as we go forward? I mean, the domestic structure causes a lot of... Um, column inches and opinions on social media, etc. And Lancashire County Cricket Club had this forum today where I heard Mark Chilton, who's in charge of their cricket up there, just list the amount of days cricket that the players of Lancashire County Cricket Club, and that would go for all the other counties as well, have had to play like six first-class games in seven weeks and travelling back from this, that and the other. And when you look at it and he reads it out in black and white, you think, blimey, that is just yeah. not an elite way. There's a lot of elite things happening in county cricket, but... Because, despite of the system, is because of it. Is the domestic aspect of what you're looking at, I know you're talking high performance, but is the domestic aspect of what you need to look at potentially the most contentious? Yeah, very difficult because, um, you know, it's a passion for a lot of people, including county members. The, the players, as you talk about there, their welfare has got to be, you know, at the forefront of things. And then we're also going to be thinking about how do we make sure that we've got this sort of balance uh, of competitions that allows our best players to play high intensity cricket so that there is not a perfect solution the truth is we've got to, in this country we play a lot of cricket which is both a benefit and a curse and we've also got to get that balance between red and white ball cricket so you know uh, since the beginning of time any changes to domestic structure have always been contentious and this time it, it won't be any different but just the point that's worth making on this uh, from, from a high-performance review perspective, we will put some options on the table for the game to consider, but we know what the governance of the game is. You know, the, 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 the counties, the county chairs have a vote on what domestic structure is played, and, and so the ball eventually will be in their court as to what they think is, uh, is the right way forward. Um, I, I'm just hopeful that, you know, and I, I think there's been a lot of mischievousness in the media and other areas around, you know, throwing kind of 
potential solutions out there or things that we might be thinking of. Most of it's completely far off the mark. And it, what it's got is, is people very polarized before we even start talking about this. I don't think that's a helpful thing for us to be doing. Like, we can come together as a game. We can do great things. English cricket actually generally is in a, in a good place. It can get better. Um, but what it's going to take is just for us to work together in order to do that. Do you think we need to play less cricket? Well, I think the schedule as it is, is unsustainable. Yeah, so how we play less cricket, in what right, format yeah. and, and, and uh, how we rationalise the season is going to be the fundamental issue here. Like when you look at a domestic structure, it is like a giant big Rubik's Cube. You know, if you want to play less cricket in one area, you know, then that probably you're doing it because you want to play more cricket elsewhere. You're obviously very reliant on the international schedule. We've got 100 that we, we know that there's a, a window there for the 100 over the next few years. So it's fitting it all together is mightily difficult. And, and that's where, you know, whatever opinions people have, um, you've got to consider everything in the round. You can't just say, well, it's all about championship cricket. It's not. It's all about how do we find the right mix and balance between formats. What's your view on all of this? Well, I have some sympathy because cricket has some unique challenges. Um, what other sport has three or even four formats to contend with. If you think of football, you know, it's a 90-minute game. You hit the ball into the net, and that's just the game. England uh, Cricket in England is, has to consider 50-over cricket, 20-over cricket, first-class cricket, uh, and now the 100, a fourth format, uh, f format thrust in. So I have some sympathy that there are no straightforward solutions here, but I would make a plea for, for kind of coherence and balance and common sense. If I put myself uh, in the shoes of a cricket supporter, for example, in this country over the last 10 or 15 years, every year you come to the start of the season and something has changed, whether it's, you know, when cricket is played, certain type of cricket is played, or even the format that it is, or, you know, the, the type of competition we're playing. It, it seems to change from year to year. So I would see this as an opportunity to try and set um, a schedule in place that has coherence and balance and sense. And that can be there for a considerable period of time. And Andrew says, and he's right to say, that the game is changing at an absolutely rapid rate. We, we, we can all see that. And it, in fact, it was inevitable from the moment the IPL came in in 2008. It's been one of my frustrations that cricket administrators have not seen what's coming quickly enough and haven't been able to position the game for what's coming. Um, but I, I would hope that just from an England cricket supporters point of view, that we can get a kind of coherent and balanced schedule that, you know, every year or at least for the foreseeable future, they can come and know that 50 over cricket is being played between mid-April and mid-May, say, and championship cricket is being played between mid-May and the end of July, say, and then short-form cricket is being played at, at, at during the August month when, when school kids are on, on holiday. And something that they can kind of get to grips with and grapple with each year. So then you get, you know, a, a flow a year in, year out. Where at the moment, you'd, you'd see it as a bit of a mess and nobody's really sure what they're doing. So I have some sympathy. I hope they can I hope uh, Andrew's uh, review can come up with some common sense proposals and then the game can come together. I, I agree with the point about the toxicity in the game at the moment. I find it very frustrating, actually, whether it's on social media or in the media or just, uh, you know, the conversations around. It, there is quite a divide there. And I don't think the ECB have been helpful in that, in, in, in bringing the, the new short form competition in as they did. And the way that it was brought in, it was kind of almost provoking, promoting a divisiveness. And that I hope we can get rid of because I do think we do a lot of good things mm -hmm. here. You know, the county championship, when you look at first class cricket around the world, very few places has the kind of support and the variety um, and the good cricket that the county championship can offer, for example. Um, and then you look at England's white ball strength over the last seven years and think of the young players that are coming through that can't get in the team, the likes of Harry Brock and Will Jacks and Will Smead, who we saw get the first 100 in the 100 the other day. Um, so that, there's a lot of talent coming through and there's a lot of good things to talk about. And I hope that somehow we can get beyond this rather toxic 
divide and, and come together as a game. Well, let's stick with the county championships. Question to you both, but I'll come to you first, Strauss. What do you think, and in your opinion, is the ideal amount of Red Bull first-class games for the counties to play to allow good quality cricket, enough cricket for members and supporters to go and watch, but also allowing players recovery? Well, and keeping, I mean, it, a, keeping it a, an elite... Yeah, look, that's a hard question to answer because it's all relative to what other cricket you're playing. I think what I would like to focus on with the county championship is the standard and the intensity and how closely it matches international cricket. So what we want in this game, and it's, this is very simple, is that if a young player is doing well in the county championship, we've got a pretty good idea that he's got the skills and capabilities necessary to do well in international cricket. So that gap between international game and the domestic game needs to be as small as possible. You think about that Australian system when it was at its best, you could argue the Sheffield Shield was probably stronger than international cricket in a lot of ways. And so I think that's the thing we need to ask ourselves and challenge ourselves for, to is, you know, is our standard high enough? Is the intensity high enough? Um, are we playing in the right sort of conditions? And probably even things like, you know, is it helpful for us to be playing with a Duke's ball all the time? I think those are the sort of questions we need to ask ourselves because if we can raise that standard and reduce the gap, it makes it so much easier for us in every other way, like identifying players, selecting players, etc. Like, what you don't want is to be looking at a good young player who's done well in the county championship, giving him an England chance and thinking, I just don't know if he's ready for this. Um, so that's the ambition. Now, of course, you're never going to get it right the way there. Um, but I think that's our ambition. How do we get our best players playing against our best players more often? And uh, we've got to get that balance right between white and red ball cricket. So, you know, I think, Athers, you'll agree with me. Like, one of the great advantages you have in this country is you play a lot of red ball cricket in different conditions. And if you believe, like I do, that the game is the great teacher, playing is a good thing. But playing exhausted and having not done any preparation work and walking around like a zombie is not a good thing either. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of low to say it's 12 games or it's 10 games or whatever. I think it's more about standard and intensity. I think, I think there is an opportunity uh, for the English game to kind of look at two months in June and July, actually, as a, almost a, an opportunity for first-class cricket here. If you, if you look at the way that the world game is going now, there are, there are windows for franchise competitions in virtually every other month apart from June and July. So you've got the IPL, which is stretching through to May, uh, from February. You've got the Big Bash in January. There's going to be a new competition in South Africa in January and in UAE in January. You've got the 100 here in August. Then you go to the Caribbean Premier League. Now, th there's, a, there's a window there in June and July that you can, you can probably say that that's, that's going to be an opportunity for England to uh, like position itself almost as the home of first-class cricket. And that, you know, a lot of good first-class players who are not perhaps down the road of playing T20 cricket can come as overseas players perhaps and play in those two months. And that's, I have a problem. The, the way the schedule has been is, is because it's so crammed, it has pushed county championship cricket. You know, we, I've done a game here, the Bob Willis Trophy in October. I remember commentating in that turret in the year of COVID in October. Now, come on, you know, when you're playing first class cricket at the end of March and in October, the things got out of whack. So I think, I think it's inevitable that there might be a, a slight reduction. It's already come down to 14. I mean, I can't pre-guess what they're going to do. But I, but I hope that those key months of June and July are positioned for, for county championship cricket and first-class cricket. Uh, because A, they're very good months of the season, which is effectively three good months, June, July, August. Um, and also just provides a window when you think how the rest of the world is, is shaping up to play their own franchise competitions which are separate from those two months. So in terms of shortening the gap between the domestic first class to test match cricket, would it be in some way helpful for selectors and players that there would be, how do I put this, a first class plus game, if you see what I mean, when somehow you can condense some of the, the, the real talent that has been identified in the county first class structure and get them playing somehow together to bridge the gap so that selectors and players can make that jump? Yeah, and I think, look, at the start of this process, we've always started with a blank sheet of paper and, and from a high performance perspective, definitely having, you know, 
those, those sort of teams where you're getting all your best players together, uh, playing together, makes sense. Now, I, I don't think that's the mainstay of our domestic structure by any means. I think the mainstay will remain with county cricket and probably should do as well. Um, but I think there are opportunities. And, of course, the England Lions is a good example of that as well. You get your next best players, or certainly in the English summer, you get your good young players. Uh, you, you blood them, you get an opportunity to have a look at them against better quality opposition, and then you take them away in the winter to try and get them used to playing abroad. Because if you want to be the best team in the world in Test Cricket, it's about winning away from home, and you need to develop those skills as well. So, look, th there's a lot that's going into this re review. As, as I said, like we can get fixated on the, the county championship and the domestic structure. I, I think that's a small part of it. What is more important for, is for us to go, like, what skills do we actually need to win in Test Cricket, both home and away? How do we develop those skills? When do we develop them? How do, you know, at, at, at county academy level, what are we trying to instill in players? At county level, what skills are we trying to promote? And therefore, how can we make sure that the, the structure of the game is promoting those skills rather than promoting different skills? And we, we all know uh, uh, anecdotally that the Darren Stevens of this world who are taking a lot of wickets, like th that's probably not going to serve you well in Pakistan in, in the winter. You know what I mean? So that, that's where we, we're obviously got challenges with the, the, the weather in this country, but I think we can move things forward away from the domestic structure while understanding the domestic structure still be part of this. Do you fear for the, the world game as it currently sits with the franchises coming in and the, the talk of certain companies, franchises, whatever, contracting a player and then loaning them back to their countries as wow. an example you know Trent Bolt turning down or sure. being asked to be removed from his contract with Crete New Zealand is quite a big thing yeah f fear is an interesting word because really the game is changing the game has always changed and will continue to change and the game that I enjoyed as a as a young man um you know it's 30 years ago now, and it, it's not going to be my game in, in the future. It's going to be the game for, for lots of other young boys and girls who will come to enjoy it, hopefully. The one thing I've always thought is, though, that if it lost first-class cricket or test cricket, I think it would lose something precious because I think that is one element, not the only element, but it's one element of what makes it a great game. There's an element of variety there, and that ability to play multi-day cricket and see conditions change and the many varied challenges that are put in front of these great players, I think that is one aspect that makes it a very precious game. So I hope that the game can find a way um, to protect that to some degree. Now, it's getting harder, as you say. The moment that really the free market came into the game, which is 2008 IPL, it seemed to me quite obvious that there would be two major challenges there. One, that domestic cricket would challenge international cricket, uh, the monopoly that international cricket had at that point. And secondly, that short form cricket, T20 cricket, would challenge test cricket. Because for all the, the, the will in the world, players will go where the rewards are great. If incentives in life matter, and if you are getting paid X for one month, you know, and that's X multiples of what you might get for a long test match, then that's players are going to do that. So you have to find a way of... You can't just let the market run riot and you can't just let it be completely unregulated or indeed rigged in a certain way. So, you know, the argument that, well, many more uh, boys and girls are going to watch the games in August at the moment in England, well, of course, because that's when school holidays are... Uh, you know, when they're on holiday. And if you're charging cheaper, cheaper tickets for the 100, of course, that will be the case. So, you, you know, how you position uh, first-class cricket vis-a-vis uh, -vis short-form cricket is very important. And I hope that the ICC can take a bit more of a lead. You know, there are certain things you can do. You can make uh, domestic franchise competitions pay for a window, for example. Uh, you can uh, have much more of a collective idea, money coming in and then, you know, spread out m more evenly. Um, so there are things you can do. Um, but, you know, inevitably uh, in the future, it will be t 2020 cricket or short form cricket that will push uh, the way the game is spread. Uh, and that will become the most popular form of the game. I think that is kind of inevitable. But I hope we can find a window still for first class and test cricket. I just think to back up your point there, Athers, I mean, 
let's not get in this mindset of it's all doom and gloom out there. In many ways, cricket has never been in a better place. It's growing in all parts of the world. We look at the rise of the women's game in, in England in particular. Um, players can go out and earn extortionate amounts of money that they never could do. The opportunities that a good young player have are better than they've ever been. And yes, you know, we're here sitting at a test match and we love test cricket. And I still believe there is going to be a role for test cricket because, you know, if you look, ask Ben Stokes or whoever, the contrast they like. They like the contrast between short form cricket and then going out and playing in, the, in their perspective the former game that really tests your abilities. And so uh, there is a room for test cricket. There's a room for T20 cricket. It may not be the same as it is today. That's OK. Uh, but I still think the two can coexist side by side reasonably happily. When it's just work of fiction, I'm in this review. <laughs> <laughs> Get voted upon uh, and delivered. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so you know, we're, we're consulting with the game at the moment. Mid-September is when we like, we'd like to be putting forward these recommendations. And, and you've raised a good point there because this solution we come up with will not be perfect. There is no <laughs> such thing as perfect in the game of cricket, but hopefully it can shift things and move things forward, uh, both from a high-performance point of view, which is important, um, but also where people feel like they can understand where their role and their relevance in this is as well. Interesting. That sucks very much indeed. So 116 for six. That's why Andrew... Myself and Michael have been chatting. The rain has been falling here at Lord's. Oh, my word.